Smells so green. And now me too. Boing, 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 boing. Open up, Colorado. It's 420. Time to grind and burn. This is not your son's stoner show. Welcome back, friends, family, cannapreneurs. Welcome to the Cannabis Community Project, a weekly broadcast podcast high up in Denver, Colorado, exploring the business side of this newly emerging Colorado economy while living the lifestyle. Dairy Berries Recording Studio, located in Arvada, Colorado, is your local recording studio with affordable rates. Mark is well experienced and will make your show, music, or any audio you have sound great. He makes our show come across the internet loud and clear every week, and he can do the same for your project or band. Take a look at Derry Berry's Recording Studio or call Mark at 303-456-8216. Community, community, cannabis community, thank you for joining me, Brainstorm, once again at the Cannabis Community Project, broadcasting from 3835 Elm Street, from the Dank Dispensary, Dank Recreational Medical Community, that's right, it's a community. Are you a cannabis business? Have you ever considered having a location or a store or an office somewhere. Well, what about the idea of having a community that was all cannabis-related businesses together? So we have Dank. We have the Twisted Sister Yoga. We have the Kush Bottles Warehouse behind. We have the CCP Studios and a couple other businesses. Who else could join together? Well, this is what we're working on here at the Cannabis Community Project and what we're working on with Dank to figure out how we can make the community a physical, tangible, realized thing where events can happen. We talked last week about what happened at Green Labs being shut down passively by the police, as well as many other places. Well, what if we actually found the place now, a warehouse in an industrial area that had the ability to hold events, cannabis-friendly events, as well as host musical bands, movie screenings, networking events, and anything your imagination can think of. Well, that's what we're working on. So make sure to join us with our weekly updates and our activities. Go to our page, Cannabis Community Project, or the news blog, Cannabis Community News. Either one, just stay up with what's going on because there's a lot going on, and we want to make sure you come along with us. So let's not forget what we're doing week after week and why we're all here. Let's start out by remembering last week's show, our short-term memory flashback. Get a couple minutes now to listen to Rick Miles and I talking about life, talking about his idea of starting a hemp longboard company. Oh, there's so much going on here. Here we go, folks. Brian and Burr. T-shirts coming out soon. the one thing too i mean one of the things that got me into trying to create the hemp boards is because there wasn't any i wanted one i started getting lawn boarding i was growing marijuana and the best i could find out there was you know the ones shaped in the leaf something like that and i was like no there's gotta be something you know but again here in america we don't have hemp like the rest of the world we import all our hemp so it's not very feasible for a lot of i guess manufacturers to create those but looking out and doing a little more research i found companies like i said the vibronics company in germany there was a company in in san francisco for a little bit that was creating some of these products and it basically is the wheels and right now the best i've seen is like a 70 30 maybe you know 80 20 mix of the hemp material the bioplastic with like the standard polyurethane and stuff wheels. So we're talking about the possibility of a longboard company using cannabis-based raw material. Correct. Making it into plastics and other type uh, materials for the longboard. Um, what would you call it, the business? Yeah, no, I had a name because I also had a name for the clothing line to be associated with it. What's going to be a uh, royal worm. All these avenues I could go down. It just seems like a very versatile name. And now all it requires is me being able to pay my rent, be able to pay for my food, or at least grow my food, preferably having my food being grown here. 
having my wife and her brother and then my, my parents that are moving in, my sister, making sure everybody is taken care of, everybody's in place. The only way they're going to be taken care of is by having some type of profitable enterprise in place, whether right. it's a job you work at. But it doesn't or, take that much to have them in place. That's the thing. It literally just takes just an extra grand a month to make everything happen, be perfect, and be fine. And I'm just working. Just takes everything. <laughs> if that moment doesn't come, I have other things going on. So either way, it falls into place because, like I said, I have these other things that I've been putting in practice. At the other time, I understand how not to exacerbate myself to certain limits. You know, if you get eaten by a bear tomorrow, it's like, well, I shouldn't have been walking in the woods. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of. Most of it's probably going to come, you know, from either doing simplifying here first, you know, as far as the food costs and everything, but also prospering in the marijuana. And, and then on there, I can have a little workshop, work on my lawn boards, or I can work on my music. Another one of my top things when I know I made it is when I can go and play music and tour or do whatever I want anytime I want. That's when I made it. That's my idea. Music has been my number one thing. Yeah, so we'll check. Back in in April. How about uh, April 20th? There you go. It's a familiar date for some reason. Yeah, weird. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we do that. That'd be chill. We probably have a lot more here. A lot more here to smoke now. Last year, there was over 200,000 people that came to Colorado. How many of them came to start a business? The competition is heating up. So if you have a business, an idea, or just some thoughts about cannabis that need to be shared with the community, do it on this show. Contact me at brainstorm at cannabiscommunityproject.com. Hey, Cannonpreneurs, let me take a second just to tell you about some friends of mine, as well as close sponsors of the show. Cushley Organic Products. The makers of Cushley have been environmental odor control consultants for more than 30 years. Their company puts out products that are used in hospitals, healthcare facilities, clinics, and homes throughout the United States and beyond. Cushley began as a product to help people who were going through chemotherapy and other patients who were in legal states but still not wanting to deal with the odor that medical marijuana brings when it is smoked. So Cushley has invented this very unique product that works like none other. I use it myself and many of my close friends and family use it. What it does is it eliminates odor. It doesn't mask it. It's not a perfume. It's not a cologne. It eliminates it. And it's organic and it's non-toxic. Please check them out. They're good friends of the show and there's a reason for that. It's because I only keep the best around my team. And Cushley is one of the best. www.cushley.com Also find them on Facebook and other social media under the same name. Cushley Organic Product. Let's go. Let's go. Yes, and that kind of goes back to a lot of people in my generation when marijuana was akin to stuffing straw in your mouth and setting it on fire. It was pretty harsh, nasty stuff in those days, not like the uh, the sweet buds we all uh, seem to see around town now. Oh, really? Go to the grind, and I'm going to make the dollar. Well, there you go. Nebraska's attorney general wanting yep. to sue Colorado now. Oh, this yeah. Guy, think... This guy is so arrogant, he thinks he can nullify 
the votes of people not only in Nebraska, but in other states now. <laughs> That's the arrogance of the drug wars. This guy still thinks cannabis is a dangerous drug. I've been coast to coast with this movement. I've yet to meet the person who uses cannabis and no other drug and is having a problem with it. Well, they call Nebraska a flyover state. There's never been more of a need for it than now, I suppose. I guess this is a good use for drones, right? As you're driving through these states, what if you just throw your drone up in the air and then uh, have it hover above you like 500 feet, just out of visible eyesight, but still pretty low. You know, fly like a half scope mile behind cops. you. Scope for cops. <laughs> or scope for cops, that too. I get, yeah, bo- or do both. Have one in front scope. Yeah. Because even if you see the cop, you still have to keep going. So eventually you're going to want to depart with your, your product. So just have it fly above you 300 feet in the air and then drive through the state. And if you get pulled over, let them search your car, go on your way. And then as soon as you're out of the state, have your drone land on the ground in front of you. And you're on your way. Well, there you go. I am green. Hey, man, I don't, I don't know anybody here, man. Me neither, You see anybody you know? Yeah. Hey, 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 you reason. Hey, bro, what's, hey, what's up, up, man? Hey, how you doing, hey, dude? what's up, man? man hey, hey, you want a beer? Uh, yeah. Beer? Yeah? yeah. Hey, please, someone man. get reason a beer. Hey, I'll be right back. I'll right. get that for you. All right, man. Hey, who the fuck was that, dude? I have no fucking idea. Oh my god, hey, hey, Dad! Hey, oh, Dad, over here, hey! Oh my god, hey, hey how are you? Hey, I'm good, you how are you? Are you me from that show? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Walking barefoot with open wounds Lord Jesus, there's a fire and I didn't grab my shoes We sit on the hillside counting the birds Our mothers were young, our fathers taught us hard work Sometimes you make me feel too much The things that I need, the things in dreams that you can't touch Whatever this race is, darling, I'm not fast enough And I'm still standing, trying to catch up Yeah, this is uh, this is all new. This is just in the last three, four weeks or so yeah, that this yeah. came together. I met um, the owner of this facility, which is Jay Griffin, at one of the events that mm-hmm. I went to, and we talked for maybe two months or three months, little by little, about working together. And it finally came down where he said, "You know, I have a little space in the u- yoga studio, yeah. and said, how would you like to set up your studio there and kind of figure out where to go from there?" Uh-huh. So this is all new. This is I just set this up 
up a few weeks ago. I've only done a couple interviews from here. This is new for me to have oh, well, permanent location. Oh, let's break it in. Big yeah, window. lots of light. <laughs> yeah, big wind on the view. And eventually, the hope is, as things grow, which was actually his idea, is that there's another room right next to this one where we could cut a hole in the wall and make that the producer studio where you have the soundboard and, mm-hmm. the, and this just the studio itself. There's already plans for how to keep growing things and making it bigger. Fantastic. It, it is. And you'll meet Jay. Jay's a, a fun guy. Okay. So, um, what's your name again? <laughs> 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 Formerly, my, my firm is David B. Bush, LLC, which wouldn't excite anybody, including me. <laughs> yeah, David Law sounds better. And definitely better than Bush Law, which makes it sound like you're a lawyer for the Bushes or something. <laughs> or I fly planes in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> like a Bush pilot. <laughs> that would yes. be a fun job. But you are a premier hemp attorney. Is that how you would classify yourself? Well, that is primarily what I'm doing is industrial hemp law. Okay. And, and there's very few of us. So if by premier, you mean one of a very few? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> uh, there's a handful of us in Colorado, and frankly, most of the other people who practice industrial hemp law are uh, really more marijuana attorneys than they are uh, industrial hemp attorneys, but they just have clients in industrial hemp space as well. So what distinguishes my practice is I'm really not practicing marijuana law. I, I have some familiarity with the rules and the applicable statutes. Occasionally, I have a client who's got a foot in both camps and needs a little guidance on uh, how to keep the businesses straight. But for the most part, what I'm doing is advising people and giving them legal assistance in the uh, realm of industrial hemp. Yes, and that is what we've done previous shows on. So if anybody would like to hear those previous conversations, just scroll down the list of archives and look for the shows that say David Law in them, which I believe there's two out there officially on the the archives. So you're still practicing out of Denver? Well, there's a nonprofit that I organized a year ago, January. So it's just a little bit over a year old now. It, uh, it almost came to life the same day as my practice did, frankly. It's called the Industrial Hemp Research Foundation. It's a Colorado nonprofit corporation, and we got 501c3 nonprofit status, which means people can make tax-deductible donations to the organization. We founded that because we realized that there was a lot of interest in conducting industrial hemp research in Colorado, including in the universities. There's a lot of academics that want to get into this, whether it's from the standpoint of social science or engineering or medicine, biology, you name it. But there hasn't been government money available. There's certainly no federal funding because industrial hemp is still considered federally illegal. And so uh, a- any number of government programs are unavailable. Funding for them is unavailable. And at the state level, the state could fund it, but so far it hasn't. Uh, there's been some state money going to marijuana research, medical marijuana, and there's an account or a fund that was created for industrial hemp research, but no money has gone into it. So that was what we faced last year and thought, well, maybe we could start a nonprofit foundation that raises money from private sources. So that was the genesis of the Industrial Hemp Research Foundation. We have our first fundraising event of this year. It's going to be on April 17th at Greenhouse, which is an office sharing complex at 6565 East Evans Avenue. It'll be from 1 to 5 in the afternoon. We're opening the doors around noon, and we're going to have speakers on various subjects. We are going to have vendors. We'll have some refreshments and a little bit of entertainment. Most important of all, we're going to have a silent auction. So come and bid on the object of your dreams and uh, walk away happy. Can you give us some hint to what the bids will will be on, what what the items are? Ah, good question. Well, we we, a bachelor uh, auction. (laughs) I'm going to have to come back in another couple of weeks. Uh, No, we we are busy trying to solicit donations for the silent auction as we speak. Oh, okay. This event is still two months off, and so we we are we're gathering that. We have a couple of things that have been committed. A a company called Hemplements, which is a uh, a retail. Store that sells consumer products made with industrial hemp. Everything from clothing to cordage to body care, lotions, things like that, uh, and and various gifts. Um, Hemplements is going to be donating some articles for the auction. Hopefully, we can get a clothing. So you're out soliciting businesses now who might want to provide 
something for the auction. For uh, is there a price range you you would prefer these items to be within? We'd really like to have big and small stuff. We okay. want to give people a choice. So if someone just wants to drop ten bucks on a haircut or whatever, you know, we could do that, and we can get uh, something bigger as well. So that is our hope to uh, get some items that are going to be for the high rollers and some for the low rollers, and, and hopefully everyone will get something. Well, I'll have to talk to the the few sponsors I have. I mean, they're all small small products and small, you know, like fifty dollar type sure. dollar amounts. But I'll talk to them and see if they would like to also donate a, a product also auctioned off. Well, and I say well, what we'll do too is uh, for uh, really little items we might put together gift baskets. Yeah. So if you have some uh, uh, product carriers here that have you know, just like hand lotion or something, yeah, that's I exactly. mean that that's hard to make an auction item by itself. Yeah. But we can certainly put together a basket. Same thing, say with bottles of wine, we may yeah. try to bundle up three or four bottles, for example. There's no end to combinations like that we can come up with if we're creative. <laughs> so yeah, let's talk some more about that. Okay. I'd appreciate it. And definitely out there in the public that's listening that has a product or a company that would like to be involved, where can they get in touch with you to speak directly with you about it? You can reach me on my phone number. My office is 303-422-0064. And my uh, email address is Bush, B-U-S-H, at davidlawcolorado.com. And I'm happy to talk to anyone, so don't (laughs) hesitate to give me a call, especially if you're coming with a donation. I'd love it. Uh, Let me just take a minute here to tell you more about the foundation and our programs here. We have, at this point, developed relationships with two universities in Colorado. One is Colorado State University in Fort Collins, which is our flagship land-grant institution in the state. That's where the College of Agriculture is. That's where all the agricultural experiment stations are uh, affiliated with and and, uh, where the research is managed. Yeah, they have, of course, a lot of other programs going on there. And there's a number of professors at CSU who are interested in conducting hemp-related research. So we have a relationship with CSU Fort Collins. We have a representative from that campus on our board of directors. Same thing with CU Boulder. They're not the land-grade school, so they have a different emphasis at that university. uh, But they do have a a wealth of expertise and a lot of subjects that could be of interest, particularly the biological sciences. We have an integrative physiologist on our board by the name of Monica Fleschner from uh, CU Boulder. A representative from CSU Fort Collins is a professor by the name of Tom Holzer. And we are in the process of trying to develop a relationship with a third campus in the state, and that's CSU Pueblo. If we have a chance during this interview to talk a bit more about where the industry is going in Colorado, those three universities tend to represent areas of the state where there's a lot going on with industrial hemp. Our hope is to be able to support research programs at those universities, and we have uh, professors that we have been in communication with that have some proposals for projects. You know, they're all going to take a lot of money to get going, yeah. and that's what we're trying to do now is is go out in the wider world and find corporate donors and other people who can help us to uh, create some pots of money to get that happening in Colorado because we're the leading state in industrial hemp, and we're going to be that way for a while. Anything from Greeley? Oh, at uh, NCU? Not at this time. Okay. Uh, we could certainly take a look at Greeley. Seems uh, like it's just the last peg in that of, <laughs> from Boulder, Fort Collins, the Pueblo. Seems like Greeley should be one of the pegs in the table there. Yeah? It, well, it, it probably should be, and I'm just ashamed to say I don't know much about uh, Northern Colorado University in, in uh, Greeley, and I need to do that. So that very well could be another campus right. that we develop a relationship with. We jump south to Pueblo because of some things that are very interesting happening in the southern part of the state with the hemp industry, and it seemed like our next logical step to take was to go there. Fort Collins, Boulder, as you mentioned, are north of Denver, northern part, and also the Fort Collins, Greeley is are going to be a little bit more east. So for people yes. looking at a map, this is where a lot of the growing land in Colorado is because it's flatter, not so many mountains, and where agriculture is already taking place. Uh, Pueblo, I've been hearing, is, they're, they're turning the corner and they're really wanting to dive in headfirst also. Is this why you're spotting Pueblo? 
as a hot area to go? It is. There are a couple of things happening in Pueblo that are very interesting. One is that there are a lot of hemp grows that have become established, outdoor and indoor, uh, in uh, generally in the Pueblo area and going uh, east from there around the Arkansas River Valley. Uh, so there is a major uh, CBD company, for example, CBDRX. They have a, a major grow operation down there. Uh, I have a client in uh, Colorado Springs who is doing some contract farming in southern Colorado. So that has really, uh, really been taking off. And in addition, there seems to be some real interest in businesses moving into the Pueblo area that are going to be uh, involved in processing and making industrial products. Probably the most notable, it's a uh, joint venture called CBD Biosciences. Mm -hmm. And this was actually uh, supported in part by some public money, I understand, in the county or city of Pueblo. Uh, CBD Biosciences is a joint venture of a couple of companies, one of which is very well known in Colorado, Open Vape. Uh, They they make glassware. And uh, then there's a company called Thar Process, and they're a critical extraction technology company. I believe they're based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And critical extraction is a process that that has uh, been used for a lot of different uh, materials and products. It's really gained attention in the cannabis industry for extracting cannabinoids. And the two of them formed a joint venture called CBD Biosciences. And there was a big splash in the news last fall when this was announced. Their plan is to occupy a building that used to be an airline building. It was a Boeing building at an industrial park near the Pueblo airport. And my understanding is basically they're talking about making an executive campus of sorts to uh, establish a CBD processing business and to provide space for other related ventures to mm-hmm. take root there. So, for example, I heard about a biofuels company that has been kicking the tires on, on getting space there. So that kind of thing is developing yeah. in Pueblo, and that's been getting a lot of attention. And Pueblo is a good area because it's already kind of a manufacturing type area. There's already uh, a few plants around that area that, that deal with coal and, and energy. It's already an area known for quite a bit of, uh, I guess, blue-collar type labor and, and work. Yeah. Uh, so Pueblo is probably a good place for those types of businesses to set up and, and find a workforce yeah. and, and have a, a welcoming environment. Pittsburgh actually reminds me a lot of Pueblo, or vice versa. Yeah. Pueblo reminds <laughs> me right. a lot of Steel Town. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, railroad tracks are made in Pueblo. That, yeah. that's, uh, that there's a, a couple of uh, major steel foundries that have been around Pueblo for forever. I yeah. mean, they, they were a major source of steel production during World War II, and uh, they went through uh, ups and downs. But I understand that uh, the old CFI facility, whatever it's called now in Pueblo, is, is where they're making uh, railroad tracks for our light rail system in Denver. Yeah. That's where we're getting it. Well, I mean, a, as you talk about this and other things come in, coming in that have to do with hemp, but also have nothing directly to do with hemp, but they're still going to affect the economy just by things like railroad tracks. You know, once you produce a bunch of stuff in Pueblo, you got to ship it somewhere. <laughs> How are you going to do that? That's Truck, right. Car, uh, people with backpacks. I mean, you got to <laughs> do it some way and it's probably going to be trained unless a more efficient means of transportation comes along, which I, I can't think of any at the time. I mean, that's kind of what we're looking at, right? Sure. Is that well, the whole economy is affected, not just cannabis-related and hemp-related businesses, but everybody's going to profit, right? Absolutely. As, the, as they say, as the rising oh, we're, tides we're, raise all, all boats, boats. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, is the expression. And I guess that's what we're seeing and what's going on here. Is your interest in this still just kind of purely a, a business interest? What is your mind Mindset now with your involvement in the industry? Well, I, I definitely think I feel vested in this industry because this is what I'm trying to make a living off of. And so... Like branding so, yourself in this industry as the, the hemp lawyer. As the hemp guy, yeah. yeah. Hemp yeah. Guy. So so the more people succeed, and this is what I tell people all the time, is, is my life's work is to help you succeed. And if you succeed, then I will succeed too. Yeah, I, I'm very vested in it. As far as business versus something else, I, I came from a litigation background, a job that I had. I was with a law firm for 15 years in Denver, downtown, and did nothing but uh, litigation, which is, I guess for want of a better phrase, trial work. And really more, uh, I'm now a business attorney, so I'm helping people before they get into litigation. (laughs) 
<laughs> and what I like to tell people is, is now, now my job is to keep you out of trouble. <laughs> Now, if you get in trouble, I'm still there to help. <laughs> and actually, I, I still have some litigation cases because of that. But most disputes people have, they, they resolve them short of going to the courthouse and filing a lawsuit. And so there's still a lot of dispute resolution negotiations that I, I undertake in my practice. It's just that they're not with, with a legal pleading and a judge. Do you but, think of yourself as a lawyer first or as a business person first? Oh, wow. That's a tough one. That is really tough. I, I, You know, I'd like to think of myself as a lawyer first, but to be a good lawyer, you have to wear a lot of hats and you have to have a broad perspective. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to be a good lawyer and to offer people good legal advice if I had blinders on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people do come to me for business advice all the time, and uh, that just is part and parcel of, of the trade. Uh, that's that's how I have to do my job. But from a legal perspective, advice, or from a business infrastructure, or I need to make this decision, and I'm not sure that that type of advice. I, I guess I'm trying to figure out is when you get associated with a person or a business, are you looking at it as well? I'm looking for the legal aspect here and how to help them protect them from a legal avenue, or I'm more of a business guidance to all around what they're doing here, and legal is just part of part of that. Well. Let me take a step back. And again, I would say that really my fundamental purpose is to help people succeed. And success for them may be they need legal services right now, which I can provide. Honestly, though, there are a number of times, many times, when people come to me and I realize they don't really need a lawyer right now. They need some kind of advice but they're not ready for a lawyer. And I'll say that, and I'll tell them, I, I, I don't think that there's anything that I can do for you as a lawyer, but let's let's talk about what your dream is here and what you might want to do next. You know, maybe in a year you'll come back and you'll have something else that, uh, that I could help you with as a lawyer. So giving advice to people, it's not just legal advice, it's all kinds of advice, and sometimes it's legal, and that's one of those few occasions where I actually do something, get paid for it. Uh, so I end up spending a lot of time with people that I don't get paid for. And again, that just comes with the territory. What is some of the growth you've seen this last year, not just in, in how many clients you've gotten, but the overall growth? When we talked, which was probably a year plus ago when we had that first interview, it was kind of a getting the, the feet wet in the waters. There right. was a few clients, few businesses, a lot of who goes first. But now that we've had a, a good year pass, have you noticed a change? Has there been an increase? Is there now an avenue that businesses are using to accelerate the pace of growth? Uh, what have you witnessed? I just think there's more activity overall. In hemp or just uh, the, the whole cannabis uh, bubble? Well, the, the whole cannabis uh, bubble has been growing like crazy, as you know, and most of the growth is still in marijuana. We, we have a almost a billion-dollar industry now in marijuana. It's going to be a while before we have anything like that in hemp. So everything is growing. Just for example, I think the acreage under cultivation that's anticipated this year, 2016, is going to be twice what it was last year. And last year, it was about 10 times what it was the previous year. So we're seeing some pretty pretty major growth. It, uh, I have heard that we are going to have upwards of 6,000 acres ex- outdoors under cultivation this year. Is, well, is that a lot? Uh, well, no, no. Compared to other crops in Colorado, that's minuscule. But for uh, hemp, that's a lot? But okay. that is a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. because that is thousands more acres than anybody else is growing okay. commercially. Uh, there, there's so much talk about the state of Kentucky. Well, they're doing some research and development, and last year they had about 920 acres total, and we had something like 2,000, 2,500 in Colorado. And that's just outdoor. I'm not even talking yeah. about indoor space, which between 2014 and 2015 went from negligible to about a half a million square feet. Mm. And I don't know what it's going to be this year, uh, but I know it's well in excess of half a million in- Indoor now. hemp growing? Indoor hemp growing, yes. Well, what is the advantage of growing hemp indoors? Well, it's just uh, the same as it is for marijuana. When you have a very high-valued product that you're trying to produce, which medicinals are, or okay. recreational okay. drugs. So this is not making textile hemp. No, This is no. making something that needs to be controlled in in a closed environment. 
Yeah, but the difference is that with marijuana, it has to be controlled because it's required that it be locked up and there be security and all this stuff. Those kind of requirements don't apply to hemp. But what I'm saying is that there are certain products, and CBD is the one that everyone knows about. It's the one most talked about. That is still a very high-valued product, and so it is worthwhile to spend the time and the money to grow it indoors, to have the perfect plant, the perfect cultivar, the perfect flower, and it's a very labor-intensive kind of work. There's a lot of expensive inputs that have to be put into it, but what you get out of it is uh, is a, a very nice crop of some very valuable stuff. But you're right. If you're growing hemp for fiber or for oil seed, that is not worthwhile to grow indoors. You'd put yourself out of business in about a week. <laughs> uh, yeah, you got to grow that in extensive field cultivation outdoors. So we're seeing both happen in Colorado, and both are happening with industrial hemp. It just depends on the product you're trying to make. What do you know about this debate going on that having outdoor hemp grows in proximity to even indoor marijuana grows, there's going to be a conflict of production value through uh, contamination, cross-contamination, that some people are pushing for segregated plots or certain distance between types of grows. Is there anything you know that can uh, help me understand where that's going to go? Sure. There's been a lot of talk about that. The only jurisdiction I know of that has actually done something about that is Pueblo County, speaking of Pueblo. Uh, And and Pueblo County has virtually run industrial hemp out of the county with with its zoning. Intentionally. uh, Yeah, they, they clearly are favoring marijuana. Okay. Uh, there, there's some strong marijuana interest in that county, and as far as I can tell, they they ran through this zoning ordinance. <laughs> Is that in a first the come, first serve type type situation? Marijuana was first, so they get the attention. Well, it could be that. It could be there's more money in marijuana. Uh, yeah. Uh, but what they uh, what they have done in Pueblo, and you're talking about cross pollination. Yes, I guess uh, so, contamination isn't the right word. <laughs> well, I mean, it is, a, it is a contamination. In fact, what I've told people is, really, uh, if you want to look for an analogy, it's like air pollution. Um, but, but let me explain what, what uh, the cross-pollination issue is. Uh, and that is, with marijuana, uh, crops are uh, pretty much always feminized. Everyone wants marijuana flowers. They want female flowers. And the way they do that is they clone a female plant and then they have another female plant. Unless someone has a reason to try try to produce marijuana seed in a breeding operation, you're really not going to see male marijuana plants. So that elsewhere in the state has not been so much of an issue because the marijuana is grown indoors in very strictly controlled environments, oftentimes with very sophisticated air filtration systems. They are pretty well protected from the outside world. Pueblo is either one of the few or perhaps the only jurisdiction in the state that actually permits outdoor marijuana it grows. I don't know why they do that, but they have. Well, the problem is this, that industrial hemp is usually not a feminized variety that's, that's grown. It's usually a mix of male and female. Where you're going to have a feminized variety of industrial hemp is when you're growing it for cannabinoids, just mm. like we were talking about a minute ago with the indoor greenhouse, very expensive operations. Industrial hemp plants are grown for any kind of cannabinoid production, it's just like marijuana in the manner of production. You're trying to get female flowers to extract the best stuff most efficiently. Otherwise, if you're growing outdoors, you either want males or it doesn't make any difference whether you have males or females. Uh, if, if you want a seed, for example, oil seed, you got to have pollination. you got to be able to set seeds. So the uh, the problem that can happen in a place like Pueblo County, because they are now allowing marijuana to be grown outdoors, you have marijuana plants that are exposed to the risk of being pollinated from industrial hemp grows. Why is that a problem? It's because people have been working very hard to try to isolate their cultivars and get just the perfect variety for what they want to produce. And here you have a totally foreign pollen from an industrial hemp plant drifting over and pollinating a marijuana plant. It can do a few things. One is if someone's trying to uh, produce that plant for uh, a a nice female flower, it's suddenly going to be full of seeds and it makes it much more difficult to work with. It could also, if there's breeding going on, it could mess up the breeding. So there are concerns about that kind of cross-pollination, contamination, if you will, from male industrial hemp plants that uh, are going to be sending their airborne pollen out. Here's some of the problems, though. People really don't understand the pollination science for industrial hemp. It's not well understood how hemp travels uh, the pollen, how 
far it travels, what the likelihood of pollination is when you get a certain distance away, what Pueblo County did without, to the best of my understanding, no good science at all to back it up, is they arbitrarily imposed a five-mile setback. Hmm. And what they require is that once someone has a marijuana grow, they have basically staked out a point surrounded by a five-mile radius, which is, mind you, 75 square miles. Oh, yeah. It's just the area of a circle, pi r squared, 75 <laughs> square miles, where because they chose that particular location to grow marijuana, they have ruled out anybody from growing industrial hemp within that radius. Now, are you talking about like a licensed business grow or just anybody? Now, you ask a good question. I don't know if this also applies to people who are growing marijuana for personal use. Yeah. I guess the only thing I could say about that is if you're growing marijuana for personal use, there's no record of it. And it has to be indoors anyways, right? It has to be locked indoors. Yeah. That's right. And so because there's no record and it's locked indoors, it probably isn't so much of an issue. But anyway, so it's the marijuana growers who are dictating where hemp is off limits. And in fact, the ordinance goes a step further and says marijuana growers actually have the power to waive that setback requirement so they can dictate the law. Uh, And if a marijuana grower doesn't want to waive the requirement that is in place, and so they have 75 miles, square miles of of hemp-free zone, well, as you can see, that's a lot of area. And it pretty much ran industrial hemp out of the county, other than the few people who are growing feminized varieties of hemp don't have males. Another aspect of unfairness to it is that uh, the ordinance also talks about indoor grows and says you can't even grow industrial hemp indoors if you have male plants unless you take all of these precautions and you have to have special air filtration systems and protective clothing and all this stuff, all of the burden, my point here, all the burden is put on industrial hemp and nothing on marijuana. There's no requirement marijuana growers protect themselves and try to shield their plants from being pollinated, if that's their concern. It just puts all of the burden on industrial hemp and has made it virtually impossible for anyone to grow anything but feminized varieties in the county. Is this an example of what happens when a group is unrepresented by a lawyer or an organization or they basically have no representation to fight their issue is that in our form of government the unrepresented just get deep plowed over and and that's the way it is i think that's exactly what happened (laughs) that there were powerful interests in southern colorado that wanted to have a monopoly on marijuana growing in pueblo county this was their chance and they took it my understanding is the whole process went through very very quickly, very quietly. There was barely any public process whatsoever. And before any of the industrial hemp growers knew what was going on, this ordinance had been passed. And there it sits. Uh, there just are not the resources. Uh, the industrial hemp people in general, they don't have the money that some of these marijuana growers do. And they were outclassed and outgunned. Is this what your nonprofit, the, the research foundation, is going to get involved in from a political standpoint? Or is it strictly an act? academic organization. Well, where I see myself is, personally, I would love to advocate for industrial hemp wherever and whenever I could. The Industrial Hemp Research Foundation, however, it's a 501c3 nonprofit. A condition of its nonprofit status is that it does not engage in political advocacy. Mm. We can't campaign for any political candidate. We can't campaign for political issues. We can't do anything like that without endangering our nonprofit status. So So what you're saying is we need another organization. We need another organization (laughs) to advocate, exactly. And and I have given serious thought to that, the possibility of creating another organization that is not a nonprofit, or if it is a nonprofit, it's not a 501c3, so that it would be able to engage in political work. Like register as a lobbyist or or represent yourself as a lobbyist and function as an operating lobbyist, that type? Well, a a lobbyist is someone who's providing that service to a another and we're talking about being uh, the, creating yeah yeah being the other yeah. creating the organization that could do the uh, the activism and uh, certainly any profit making organization is free to advocate all they want and uh, and there are certain forms of nonprofits for example a 501c6 trade association can uh, advocate uh, in the political arena unfortunately if you make a donation to a 501c6 it's not tax deductible so uh, what the government because takes you're involved in ad- or 
gives advocate. or takes away. <laughs> Is yeah. that why they're punishing you for being an advocate? They're not letting you deduct it because you want to use that money for political causes? The idea with the 501c6 is it exists for the benefit of its members. Okay. So the nonprofit organizations typically are ones that are charitable, educational, something of that nature. And our foundation that we've been talking about, it's an educational and research foundation. So it, it fits perfectly in, uh, in, in the charitable realm. Religious organizations could be nonprofit. It's when you start serving yourself that the government says, well, you may still be a nonprofit, but we're not going to give you all the benefits <laughs> because you, you are not a charity. You're not right. helping other people besides yourself. A 501c6 trade association is what we're talking about. Those kind of organizations exist for the members of that trade association. And so that's the one thing the government doesn't give them is the ability to get tax-exempt donations. What about these L3Cs? Are you familiar with these? L3Cs where you are a for-profit LLC, but you're functioning like a nonprofit. So you get to dabble in some of the best of both worlds. It's called an L3C. The only place I've heard is out of Delaware where they, mm. they actually register. But it, it lets you be a for-profit, but because your activities are like a nonprofit, it gives you certain benefits of a nonprofit and certain types of deductions. And stuff. Well, I've never heard of an organization form like that existing in Colorado. What we have in Colorado in terms of kind of a hybrid, like you're mentioning, is something called a public benefit corporation. And the idea with a public benefit corporation is that you can be a for-profit organization. You could run like a business and make money, but the purpose of the organization is broader than just benefiting the people who own it. And, and typically, Typically, where this comes up is you have a corporation that issues shares of stock to investors, to stockholders, to whatever. It depends on whether you're talking about a public or private corporation. And the quandary that many of those organizations then find themselves in is their boards of directors are beholden to the stockholders. That they have to do what benefits the stockholders, even if it's something they think is socially inappropriate, even if they really have some doubt about whether that is better for society. And so the, the philosophy of a public benefit corporation is you can still form a corporation, you can still have stockholders and investors, you can still make money, but the company can declare that it has loyalties beyond the actual owners. Mm -hmm. And so that's a little bit of a novel idea. And it's not a nonprofit, but it is what, you want to call it a corporation with a social conscience? I yeah. guess we could say that. And, and that's what was created in Colorado just a, a few years ago. I yeah. think the law was enacted in 2013. And it's kind of a trendy thing. There are other states that yeah. have enacted similar uh, similar laws. It's a rise of this social entrepreneur yeah. idea with the multiple bottom line of creating companies where there's multiple bottom lines other yeah. than just what's the red line at the bottom. Right, but right. there, what else are we trying to accomplish here yeah. um, is the concept. And, and I guess that is maybe not new, but maybe just a more emerging idea these last five some years. Well, there, there's a consultant I know and his mantra. And, and it, he does consulting for people and personal issues and business issues. But his motto is people, planets, and profit. No, sorry. Planet? People, planet, and profit. <laughs> yeah, there's only one planet in here that we live on. Sorry. I didn't even get that right. But uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> People, planet, and profits. Well, this is a, a good example of why we need a premier lawyer, right? Of why everybody needs a lawyer. Because even if your intention is to just go out there in the world and do something good and you're not really planning on making money, you still might need some legal guidance on exactly how to set that up, you know, what type of formation you want to do. And as I tell Tell everybody who asks me, talk to a lawyer. You spend a few bucks up front, but getting set up properly is so beneficial in cost savings. Even if your goal is to be a non-money making entity, you should still talk to a lawyer to know what to get set up. Well, you want to keep yourself out of trouble. You want to make sure you're not making bad decisions that could invite some regulatory authority down on you or perhaps get yourself into a fight with someone you have a contract with. And 
and uh, that's certainly advice that I can yeah. give people. How to get into contracts, how to get out of contracts, uh, how yeah. to operate under a contract. Those are all things I can help people with. So don't just tell people they need a lawyer. Tell them they should talk to Dave. Uh, yeah, I, I do. I yeah. do. You're, you're the only <laughs> lawyer I promote. Um, <laughs> you know, and I can give a, a personal testimonial to you also. Last year when I had that contract for sponsorship, in my mind, it was just a very loose, casual agreement. And we, we spent quite a few hours actually working on that piece of paper. And it really brought in my horizons of, you know, there's a lot to think about here more than just what I was thinking about. Because what I was thinking about was a very small piece of what I was trying to get done, which was just, you know, I just want to get a sponsor. I haven't signed a piece of paper. They gave me some money, you know, and here's the basic transaction. But you actually brought up questions and clarity and points of confusion in what I was writing. That really made me realize that you need an outside set of eyes on anything you do. And you really need somebody who, who's an expert in their field and contracts and law. I mean, don't, don't downplay yourself. You're, you're very <laughs> educated, very experienced and been doing this for a very long time. Yeah. So I'm going to say premier in all senses of the word. You're, you're a great lawyer <laughs> and uh, highly educated. And if I have any business questions, you're the person I'm coming to. <laughs> well, and, thank you. and I would like to see more people come to you to try to ex- expand this hemp business. Where else is it going to be at in the future, right? Where else is the industry? Sky is the limit. The, the reason yeah. I think of that is because I actually I actually have a document I, I'd like to uh, go over with you. I'm thinking about investing in a company who uh, is starting out called MedEx. They created an organic, non-toxic pesticide that the state of Colorado has put on their list of approved pesticides oh, already. Wonderful. And they're offering shares through a crowdfunding type format, but they're offering actual shares, penny stock type stuff. And the the initial buy-in, the lowest you can do is $420. And it, it has... <laughs> Where do they get that number from? <laughs> well, the, the way he said it, the way he said it was the, the way that they got it to work out is it has to be within 10% of your income. So he figured everybody makes at least $5,000 yeah, a year. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And that was one of the rules he's trying to right. follow is that yeah. in order to be a, a non-accredited you know, investor, yeah. it has to be 10% or well, less. I just laugh because there are so many plays on the number 420, you know, <laughs> right. and right. I, I never heard of a minimal investment of 420, but you know, why not? We have 420 everything else. This is a situation yeah. where I'm an individual. Uh, I have a company that looks appealing. It sounds appealing. I interviewed the guy. I looked at his websites. I looked at everything. And now here's an opportunity to invest. Do I pursue that alone? I'm by no means sophisticated in any type of financial doings to be investing or anything else. Or is it worth it to consult with a lawyer. Maybe I'm only investing $420, but at the end, having somebody who can spot things in contracts and ask the right questions, it may either save me that $420 up front, or it may allow me to actually invest it and make money in the future. We should look at that. We should take a look at that and see what it says. I'm going to come back to you and have me be your client for an hour as we uh, go over this, because I'm seriously wanting to invest in it. It seems like a great company, but I'm hesitant because I'm unsure about the legal aspect of this big 20-page thing that he sends yeah. to everybody who wants to uh, sure. be an investor and all the, and the jargon and what does it mean well, and what's the difference between you know dilution and all this other types of, of stocks he's offering and I have no idea. Well, and I'll tell you, probably some of what's going on there is, I, I will have to admit this is an area of the law I don't know very much about, but crowdfunding has become easier recently because of legislative changes that allowed it to proceed without violating certain securities laws. And the securities laws and regulations, they're very complex, very arcane. You have to be a specialist in that area of law to really practice in securities. I would I would have a hunch that whatever that legislation actually provided for probably set forth some requirements to behave like you are selling securities. Right. And probably some of what's in that document is federally required to comply with these new regulations. It is. Which makes it complex. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of talk about risk and potential, and it's a lot of talk about acknowledging what you're getting mm-hmm. into and everything else. And, and, you know, it's a big, long document. But okay. at the end of the day, it's a company that's growing. It's a company that has already uh, acquired a couple million dollars in initial investments. It's a company that has a product that seems to be taking off from a commercial aspect, but has yet to be put on the, the retail residential market. The state of 
Colorado has already accepted it as an approved pesticide uh, use, which here in Colorado is a big issue. So in my mind, I'm going, okay, it seems, you know, it seems like something that's legitimate and good, but who knows? Just like the contract I was writing up with sponsors, in my mind, it was just a small, casual little thing. But Well, that is a huge leg up. If you're telling me the state really has seriously looked at this particular compound and approved it. I mean, there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there, I'm sure you're well aware of, who promise you everything and promise you that everyone loves this and they've gotten all the approvals and so forth and and they're not really telling you the truth. If in this case it really is true, that's a huge thing. The law is a significant cost and people sometimes fail to recognize that, especially when you're getting into a very heavily regulated environment that we have in cannabis is that being able to comply efficiently with the law is every bit as good as saving energy. You know, it's another thing you're doing better than your competitor. Mm-hmm. So that 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 may really be an exciting product to invest in for that very reason, that they have an institutional advantage in already being an approved pesticide that many people can't claim. Yeah, It's intriguing, but uh, let me take a look at that with you, yeah. and, and we can talk about uh, whether there's any snake pits or uh, <laughs> red flags or, or snake anything. Oil. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of topics that uh, we can get into next time we talk. Uh, so what's the next step of where we can trail off here and leave Leave people with a good impression of, of kind of where you are, where the organization is, and what's coming up that they can get involved in immediately. We talked about the April 17th. So people should go straight to the website, the Industrial Hemp Research Foundation. Go straight to the website, make your donation, read up on it, uh, be a volunteer, or just figure out a way to get involved, right? Uh, absolutely. And I can suggest a couple things in that regard. For those of you who are interested in learning more about industrial hemp and becoming involved, there is a huge event. It's the biggest one of the year in the state of Colorado, and we're the biggest hemp state, and that is the Northern Colorado Hemp Expo. It's going to be held on Friday and Saturday, April 1st and 2nd, at the Ranch Events Complex in Loveland, and I'm sure the organizers of the Northern Colorado Expo would be thrilled to know that I'm giving them a plug. But I will say, this is the third year that they've done it. Nice. And it has gotten bigger every year. They had, I believe it was about something in the order of 1,500 attendees each day that they had it last year. It was quite large, uh, which is huge for hemp. I mean, that's nothing for marijuana. You could have 30,000 people come to the Cannabis Cup, right? Which I heard is not happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That got the (laughs) kibosh. No, it'll happen. It's going to happen somewhere else. They need to make it like Woodstock. They need to go rent a farmer's field about 50 miles out of town. Pueblo. Exactly. (laughs) In Pueblo, yeah. they can raise hell and everyone will be happy. Yeah, so a, a big hemp event pales in comparison to a small marijuana event. But NOCO is a big hemp event. It's the biggest by far. It's all hemp all the time. There's going to be a lot of exhibitors. There's going to be speakers. In fact, I think I may be a speaker. I have applied and I haven't heard back yet, but I'm hoping they, they like my idea and will let me talk. So that's going to be a two-day event and very worth your while. It also is a whole lot less expensive to get into. Everything in hemp is less expensive. You can pay hundreds of dollars to walk in the door of some of these marijuana events, and I believe the admission for NOCO is something like 20 or $25 a day. Nice. So go. Go, and you can meet all kinds of people. The other thing I would recommend is take a look at the website for the National Hemp Association, and I think the website is literally nationalhempassociation.org, and they will be announcing the fundraising event for my nonprofit, the Industrial Hemp Research Foundation, The NHA is also, of course, giving plugs for the Northern Colorado Hemp Expo. They have monthly socials that are free and open to the public. So that's a real good way to network with people, especially if you are an entrepreneur. It's a very, very friendly organization to new businesses. They're trying to get anyone who wants to be in the hemp space to join up and mix up with everyone. So those are real good ways to get involved. And then, of course, call me, David Bush, at www.davidlawcolorado.com. My email address is bush, B-U-S-H, at davidlawcolorado.com. And my business phone is 303-422-0064. You got questions, you got a problem, you just want to talk, give me a call. I'm there. (laughs) About business or hemp, hopefully. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully about the business of hemp. Well, I also do some other things. I'm also licensed to practice the Federal Court of Claims in Washington, D.C. So if you have a contract dispute or a military pay dispute with 
with the U.S. government. Oh. I can help you with that. Uh, and I'm also a construction lawyer. That's what I did for 15 years before I was a hemp lawyer. I represented contractors and developers when they got sued. So I know a lot about construction defects. If you have a leaky roof or you built a leaky roof and someone is mad at you over it, uh, you can come to me and, and I can help you with that kind of issue as well. Nice. You're, you yeah. got all sorts of stuff there. Uh, I got a few <laughs> tricks in my bag. Yes, I do. <laughs> Uh, let, let's go out on one one good note. Can you give us one piece of advice that an entrepreneur would need from step one? It doesn't have to be the first thing they do, but one of the first things somebody should do if they want to start a business, they're like most of us, maybe individuals mm-hmm. or just a couple friends, no real resources, but they have either a product or a product in mind. They want to move forward. What, what's the first thing they should do or one of the first things? First thing, is nobody. Nobody should be ashamed to start in the basement. And that is what I see over and over again is people think the only way they can start a business is to find that magic investor, the rich Uncle George out there somewhere who will give them $43 million for them to build their empire. Can I tell you how many successful businesses has started with virtually nothing? And I'm going to include you in that. I've seen how you have been very frugal and how you've been very flexible and very creative and very entrepreneurial. And you have a very nice broadcasting company. People should not be ashamed to start in their garage, start in their basement. Think of Steve Jobs. Think of all those people who have made incredible contributions to the American economy and to our consumer economy and started from nowhere. You can too. I appreciate that. And it'll be so much more when I actually turn this into something. (laughs) Look, you got me here talking to you. I'm honored to be here. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. We will have you back again. Thank you. Keep chatting. Pleasure to be here. There you go, canopreneurs. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to all of you, friends, family, everybody who has followed me over the years, supported this show. This is how it happens. Hey, if you like that, what you just heard, make sure to come back next week. If you have something to say, you want to follow up with today's topic, today's show, follow us on the social media. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, Mass Roots, we're everywhere, even on YouTube. Just make sure to make this community your community, and we can do it again. We'll see you next week.